it's a real pleasure to welcome to High Performance, Mark Cavendish. Thanks for having me, guys. Nice to see you. Let's start where we always do, Mark. What is, in your mind, high performance? Honestly, like, I think it's not, it's not just strive. I, I know a lot of people say, like, always strive to do your best. But for me, like, I don't know. It, it's always strive, not just strive, striving to be your best, but the best, you know, and you always get an extra thing and that. You won't always be the best, but always strive to be the best. Like not just that you can be, but of 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 anyone that's doing it. Of this competitive nature, it's not necessarily that healthy sometimes. But uh, that's how I was always quite hardwired. So, see, that's a really interesting first answer, Mark. Because um, I was telling you um, off air before that I contacted some friends of yours from yeah. back on the Isle of Man. And asked them for their recollections of you. <laughs> yeah, but, and uh, a friend uh, called uh, Trevor had uh, told me that he was a few years above you in school, and he's got a very distinct memory of you at the age of ten telling kids right. that you were going to be the world's best ever cyclist. So where do you think that comes from? Well, I think it was. A, it, I think it was a. It was a yeah, a couple of years later, but I knew quite. I don't know, and like okay. It's, cycling the cycling side of it like I knew I was good quite early like it's not an arrogance thing you, you know when you you're actually really good at something without trying to be good at it you know what I mean that's that's a different thing but I don't know just at school whether it was a spelling test or whether it was like yeah in the school football team playing against other schools I, I had to win it, well, I couldn't it wasn't just go out have fun or be, I had to win and turn everything in competition and my kids are like that as well. Well, a couple of them, the youngest one especially, like he's like a C and he turns everything, everything into some form of competition. Like, and uh, yeah, like I think with the cycling, like like that when when I said that when I was younger, like I started cycling, I was always on a bike. I didn't, my family didn't ride a bike, and that, like they didn't, you know, do it as a hobby or not. And I, I just had a bike. But when I think now, I was always on a bike and I didn't know that it was cycling that I loved. I just thought everyone rode bikes, yeah, you know? But then when I started racing, like, it was pretty, pretty quickly, like, that like, I was just, I, I, I knew it was something I could do, you know? Like, you, like, I think you see it with, you know, you see it with young footballers, you know, when there's someone who's got something, you're Did like, you find it I'm going, yeah, like, and I loved it. I think that was a, a key thing as well. You know, when you love something, you do it more, don't you? And then when you do it more, you get better at it. And when you, you get better at it, you love yeah. it more. Yeah. It, it snowballs like that. It's, and it was just like that. And uh, so I was like 13 and I wanted to, like, I didn't want to race in the 14s anymore. I want to ride within the 16s. And then I won that. So I want to ride within the 18s. So that would, you know, when you know that, you know, then you can, you can be good, you know, and that's when I started to say, like, I'm going to be a cyclist. Like, this. But why no did you need to win? It, what was it that winning gave you? I don't know. I never really thought about it. Like, I, th I know that you can look at some people and you can be like, okay, they needed to feel a self worth or something like that. It was never anything like that. It was just a competitive nature, just a naturally competitive nature. Um, so you say naturally competitive, right? Well, let's talk then about nature versus nurture. <laughs> Were you born with this or did your parents do something that loads of parents listening to this would love to do for their kids? And you're now a parent of three children. Yeah. I'm sure they're all very different. So you now get a really fresh understanding of nature versus nurture. Yeah, I can't talk that what my parents did. Like they were, the one thing I can say is they were always supportive of everything that we wanted to do. Like in so many sports, different sports, things, even like that. Like, I did ballroom dancing. I was in like I, I played football, athletics, um, cycling. And I was even I played played in a band and that. We were always doing different things and always getting like okay, it's, it's not like you're traveling miles and miles on the Isle of Man, but always getting caught around to do stuff. Like always supported it, um, and like in the summer holidays and that, always at different sports school and and things like that. Um, so they always like encouraged. Also, whatever we did, well, they didn't force to do anything. But if we wanted to do something, they, they, they'd be like that. And uh, but I know from the nature nurture side, I can just talk as being a parent that, like, my youngest Casper is three, and he's been round cycling the least. 
like round at the least, but he's, he's, he's me. I see everything he does. You know, you, you see one that like everything they do, you just laugh at. Cause it's like, what's, I know exactly what's going on in their mind. And uh, he's like, he sees a sprint and he sees bike race and he understands what's going on, understands what was the he riders, again? he's free. Wow. And he was on and how do you know he understands it? What do you see? Just how he talks about it. It's like, it's weird, man. It's like, it's like, uh, yeah, it, it, it's weird. But he, you know, he rides like he was on, he was always pushing to be on a bike. He was on a little balance bike before he was walking with 11 months. He was on a balance bike. And then uh, he was de desperate to get a bike with pedals. I want a bike with pedals. I want a bike with pedals. And so, like, yeah, at Christmas, we got a bike with pedals. So it was two, two and a half. And I uh, thought, okay, I reckon he'll get it in an hour or, or something like that. I'm going to teach me, me boy to ride a bike at, at, on Christmas Day. So I took him out, put him with his bike. And I went in to get the other bike for, for, for my other boy. And when I come out, Casper's riding around. <laughs> so I was like, God, half of me was proud, half of me is good because I couldn't teach him how to bike. There's that kind of competitiveness even there. I wanted to be the one to teach him, but he did it. Um, and he, he's just like, he wants to do it. He watches what you're doing. He, he, he watches and tries to take things in. I can remember doing that. And I can yeah. remember always like, I still to this day, like like study like races. And I, even if if I win, like, I work. okay more and more people do now probably probably most most professional pilots don't do it but like we were the first guys to look at our own sprints whether we won or not and analyze how they went and uh and see what we can do wrong what we did right and 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 even watching other people and like subconsciously you, you kind of can take things that you know if you enjoy something watching it subconsciously you, you're you're absorbing what's going on and so take us into your world there then, Mark. So when you're watching a, a rival, what are the kind of tells that you're looking for that? Without giving too much away and actually without going too intricate, because like I know um, there's a lot different between talking between a casual person who watches cycling and a cycling fan, you, you talk differently. But it can be the timing of when somebody sprints or how strong the team is or just looking for tendencies really um and cycling's quite a, a, a different sport in that uh you know if you have football tennis is one versus one it, it, it's a, team a or player a versus player b um cycling there's so many variables because there's 200 bike riders in the tour de france say so although you've got the team say 20 teams but you all want to be in the same place road so some you might have one team looking at the tactics of another team, but that plays in the advantage of, of, of another team because they're not watching what they're watching mm -hmm. each other rather than watching it winning. And and so you can't really, you can just study and know things that, so you're kind of aware of it while, rather than you, you use it as a... But what about characteristics of a rider where you think, I can break him on this moment or that he's going to be tough in a different context um oh yeah a lot and especially like especially around like uh um like how riders are in the head and uh it's actually i know we're gonna we're gonna talk about it but um like i always saw like if somebody was quite mentally fragile i always kind of use it to my advantage and you, you, even if it's just a comment in the media or something like that and you know you could get inside someone and uh it's only now since I've, I've like I would have said like like six years ago, seven years ago, said like yeah, depression or mental health um, issues is it's just an excuse. It's it's just you just like you know like it's being weak, grow up, and so it's absolute karma that you know. And I've suffered from depression in the last years, and it was like I was one of those people who was like. Yeah, it's not real, you know. And uh, and I, I, in fact, went further and that. Uh, I didn't just think it was real. I'd use it to my advantage if I thought somebody was weak, you know. And uh, it's not a weakness and it can be real quite damaging. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, ultimately, okay, 
it worked for a benefit of of mine in the past, but it's not something I'm, I can say that I, if I could take something back, that would be like something that that I would just from understanding it from a personal perspective now. So, what are the things in your life now then that you think are better or you you're different because of that mental health journey that you went through? Um, understanding people and people's situations, I guess, like especially like. Sports people, like, it's, you have to be selfish. It's a, even if you're not a selfish person, what you do is selfish. It's, it's, it's what you do. And uh, if that, if that kind of makes sense. Mm. Um, and uh, you kind of absorb in your own little bubble. And it doesn't matter what sport you do. It's always, it's not even, you're not into sport or the world. You're into your sport, you know. That's why the Olympics is so, um, it's such a strange place to be, like the Olympics Village and that. Like we were talking about London just before, weren't we, Jake? And uh, what makes the Olympics special is that you got the top of every every sport. All the all the swagger in their little bubble the whole year, the swagger, and you see there's a real like in the villages and that, like there's a real load of like, eyeballing going on because they all think they're the best at what they do. Like you know, like like. If you, it, 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 when you're doing the stuff with the Premier League, like they're the best players in the world, and then they're in their little bubble, like you know, and so they got swagger, and they you can get away with that swagger. But then when you put in with everyone else who's the best at what they do, do you see what I mean? Is yeah. it's almost like so your depression took you out of that bubble, did it? Yeah, it was like it made me see that. Yeah, it, it took me out of. It just made me realise that. Well, I, just, I wouldn't say it made me realise like the work I had to do. It made me understand what probably most other people, not most other people, a lot of other people have to do. You know, it's, oh. there's, like there's a struggle. Like life is life. Life is a struggle. It's not all like you just think if you put in work. It comes out, and like you have crashes and stuff. But when, and I'd never had a, I'd had setbacks, but never a real setback, you know. And especially over the last two years, like a lot of people have gone through hard times, like like real hard times, harder times than 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 what I've been through. And you can have a an empathy to that, or an understanding of that that I perhaps wouldn't have had before, because I've just been my little war, you know. So what were the warning signs for you then, Mark? That you that depression was creeping up on you um that was no one i didn't i didn't know and i didn't know something was wrong it's you don't know um i was i was just diagnosed with it. i was so i was here like i got epstein Barr virus and um, which most people have you get it when you when you're a teenager i had it when i was a teenager it's, it's glandular fever you know and that most that that stays in your body for most of your life and it's like a coward virus that if if you run down if you if you're stressed, it, it it can flare up. And I did this massive year in 2016, and I, I wore the yellow jersey at the Tour de France. I was world champion on the track. I was second on the road. I was second in the Olympic Games. And swapping between the road and the track is a big thing. Like it's hard to do. Um, consistently doing it throughout the year, it took its toll. And I think that's why I flared up being a 17. And I was, I, I was, yeah, the the biggest impact of Epstein-Barr virus is fatigue, like like chronic fatigue. And uh, I couldn't walk upstairs, I couldn't spend time with kids, I uh, couldn't do anything. And I tried to get back cycling, and I, I just couldn't back. I, before that, like cycling, like I said, like, I worked hard, I was always professional, that's why I was better, but it was a game when I was doing it, because I knew I was training more than everyone else, so I could, I could win. And that's what you got from it. Then all of a sudden, I was in this point that I wasn't just not competing for the win. I was like nowhere near a level that I could mm. be professional. Like, and um, I was in like real, like poisonous environment. I was at the current team that I was in. Um, yeah, they did like what I would do before and use it to, as a as a kind of to hit you with it, you know, and so I can't. What can I say? I was guilty of that before, uh, and uh, but uh, 
yeah, like it didn't make any sense to me that I was, I went from, you don't go from being the best to being the worst without something wrong. And then there was a perception that it was like, or, or it felt like that. Mm. So and how were you uh, made to feel then? Um, yeah, just like, like you had this whole team on your shoulders and you couldn't perform and you were expected to perform and you're expected to be, you're carrying the weight of a team on your shoulders, but you can't do it, but you're not getting the support to be able to do it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, I, I, I couldn't understand. Like, so I'd gone, the team I, I, I was with, like they had a big charitable impact. They worked with a, a, a charity called Quebecer, which uh, through programs, they, they, they get bikes to, to, uh, yeah, to, to underprivileged areas in South Africa, you know, and, uh, that was a big reason I went to, uh, to this team. Um, and it was only a small team, like it was a small team and it was like, okay, we'll go there and use who I was as a, a catalyst for good. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, uh, and ultimately it's, it was, uh, it, it was that move that, that, that caused everything. Like all, all of a sudden, like, I didn't think of the impact of, I thought I could do good with my name. I didn't realize that I then had to carry everything. And I was, you know, it wasn't like I was paid ridiculous amounts to, to, uh, to carry that. And, uh, it was just that just put on, like no one else wins because then, you, you know, you're on a different kind of pedestal because when you've won everything, all you can do is lose. And then people, you know, people who, don't win. They're always like, mm. like all of a sudden, they, oh, well, they nearly won. They nearly won. They nearly, like, and it's still the same now. Like, I, we, we, we'll talk about the Tour de France this year, but like, I've won for three years. I come back and mm. it was great when I won a stage. And all of a sudden, I felt quite soon that all I could do was lose, you know? Instead of winning four, yeah. like, some people say, oh, hard luck for the Sean's loser. Cause it, come on, like, you know? But like, anyway, that's how it was. Like, I had a different pressure than than anyone else and uh couldn't come back and i was like saying something's wrong physically with me something's wrong and they weren't no one would do anything no one would do anything and then i called an old team doctor like and he's now um he runs the the uh medical programs for uh Bayern munich fc roma like like this he, he, he he's the boss of the, the hospital in hamburg um, and just because I'd worked with him quite many years, you know, and I knew that he always believed me and trust me. I said, something's wrong with me. <laughs> like something's wrong. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, come to Hamburg and, uh, got some physical, mental, uh, physical and, uh, yeah, mental, uh, tests and that. And, uh. I got diagnosed with clinical, clinical depression and I still had Epstein Barr in my system. And they were like, okay, maybe you got it. You don't know which way it came. Mm, sure. But, but like as that. a guy with this kind of bulletproof self belief that you'd hardware, you'd use that almost as um, a weapon to attack others with. How did you process that when they gave you that diagnosis? It's quite nice to have an answer. Cause I didn't, I didn't want well, not an answer. It's like, it wasn't like I thought something was wrong. I knew something was wrong with me, but I didn't, wasn't thinking like, but, well, you don't think that you, it's weird. It's like, you don't think you don't feel it. You don't, you don't feel any, any way. It's not like, like, I think the word depression, people don't think you're just going to be sad. You're not even sad. You just don't feel anything, Do you know? Yeah. And you can be sad and things, but it's not a sadness. It's like something will, will, something will get to you and it's in a rational, it, it gets to you quite irrationally. Like it doesn't make sense why, why something's annoyed you or why you're irritable about so it. What sort of things in that period um, would, would you react strangely to? Oh. Okay. I know like houses are noisy and kids going up, but like, like when, when, Sometimes I'd hear every individual sound that was going on with the kids. And then even, even my wife, Peter, like her walking 
would be like, I, I just want to go out of the house. That's her walking in the house. And she's my best friend, you know, and we'd never argue. And like stuff like we never do. And like stuff like that, like the walk and annoy me. Like, I think about it now. By the time you don't think about it and you don't think that's stupid because you you don't know that that well yeah. what whatever's going on. You just Yeah, you either have no no feeling or just the most erratic like feelings that don't make sense to, if that if you understand. Yeah. So, so taking your your mindset then that you developed from being a, a young boy of wanting to be the best and wanting to conquer any challenge that you met, what lessons did you learn about ta uh, taking on depression that people listening to this would be able to uh, yeah. to adopt? I think. Is you know when you when you talk a sports person can talk to another sports person about this about sport you understand what you understand what what it is you do more I, th I think I always find it anyway and uh, with mental health issues as well I do find talking to someone of course people say talk to someone but I I always find myself talking to someone who has experienced similar is a lot more beneficial. You know, um, it puts a different perspective. It's, it's not like, as well, like you, you won't necessarily get um, just sympathy. You get a, a, a clear perspective on it, um, yeah. and uh, that 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 helped me. Just like, so you found a, someone to talk to. Did you? Who I, I had a, a few. Yeah, a few. A former sports person. To. Yeah, was. man. No, 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 not really. No, um, I had a uh, like I I worked with psychologists and that in the past. I didn't really like sports psychologists and that. And uh, I was introduced to to one guy, and uh, he just was different how he was, and like it wasn't like I had to speak to him every week and that. But it it it, it was more like I, I didn't think I didn't feel like I was being assessed or judged or something do you, yeah. do you know what i mean and likewise like one thing that some people just want or, or not just some people like, you feel like you just want sometimes sympathy and it's not the best thing do you know you have to have a clear yeah. and, and some people would tell me right do this do that like like right stop feeling sorry for yourself or stop just going on a monologue like let's do something like write a list do it there and, and it was these things that the kind of like proactive things like being a sports person you know you, you can't look at what's wrong you kind of look but like, what do i need to do to get there and put a process in place and that's how you get there you know right can you share with us any of the the processes that really work because we have a lot of people who get in touch with us they listen to these podcasts they've got issues in their own life and these conversations really help them and i, but I had a slight mental health crisis when I was much younger than you were. I was 18 and I went to see someone and the best bit of advice that she gave me, because I was obsessing about why I was feeling this way. She said, listen, maybe this is just something that you're going to have to live with. You might just have this. And that was the best thing. So I was able to let go of it and go, yeah, maybe I will. And sometimes I get like a little tiny feeling where you think, oh, hold on. Remember that feeling from 20 years ago or 15 years ago? But then I go, I know I have it. So it sort of sits in the background. Was there anything that was said to you or tools that you employed that you wouldn't mind sharing with us do you have any well do you like can i turn it around mm. do you like do you know when you feel that feeling do you have anything that you, do you just get on with or you have a coping mechanism that stops it coming my coping you know mechanism I mean? every time is yeah. just to say that it's a trick okay so i was just convinced that i was just going to do something wild and crazy right ridiculous stuff and i said to her i'm, I'm I think this is going to happen. And she was saying to me, yeah, but people that do wild and crazy things don't sit at home obsessing that they're going to do it. I got to the point where I said to my wife, I'm going to employ a full-time person to be with me to make sure I don't do anything mad. And she, she was my girlfriend at the time, thankfully didn't leave. <laughs> and then this woman said to me, yeah, the point is you're not going to do it because you're just, thinking, about she's it. thinking about doing it. So now when I, this, a thought will come in my head, a stupid thought, I'm driving along, I'll just crash the car, right? 
you go, stupid thought, tricking me. And it's a trick and it's so powerful because then you can totally change your thinking to be, if you can write a bad story and believe it's real, then you can also write a good story and believe it's real, which takes us into the world of manifestations and positive mental images and believing you're going to do well and then you do. And that's what works for me. I, I don't know whether that chimes with anything that, you, that pops in your head when you get that feeling. Uh, it's more of a, I don't know, like I don't think I could go with just going, that's a trick. Like I have to actively do something. Like if I, if I, if I get now, like if I feel something, like I have to find something to do or, yeah. or some way to not be a, like, you can, it, it comes. Unfortunately, a lot of people that are suffering perhaps don't know they're suffering. You don't know any different. Like yeah. I said, you don't, you don't know. You're not kind of aware what's going on. You don't. How do you, have how the do you know when you you're slipping back? <sighs> it's 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 like trial. It, it's not trial and error. It's like from being there, from understanding it now, and it takes till you understand it to know when it's happening. Yeah. If that makes sense. So unfortunately, I don't know the answer to someone who doesn't know they're suffering right now. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But if you do know, and it does help to have a diagnosis, uh, but it also helps if you're open with it, um, because you you can you can say right, and you do this now. Like for instance, I, I yeah I, I try and try and get surrounded by people as quick as possible. Yeah, not necessarily people I'm going to talk like just just do something. I, I do something that that is it's not. It's going to stimulate someone else in my brain than mm. than than say perhaps what's going to happen. Sure, if that makes sense. See, what strikes me, Mark, is just the bravery for you to be able to come out and speak so openly about depression, given that your previous history of seeing it as a weakness or, or a flaw in someone's character, as opposed to their chemistry. So, what advice would you give to anybody? in terms of opening up and speaking like what have you found the benefits of it and also the consequences of it um, honestly i don't know i don't think i <laughs> i don't know apart from being able to embrace it yourself i don't think open up and talking is it's good to talk to people like it, and people say that but i don't Rather, I think it's more of a, it stops you holding it in rather than you can get it back, unless you're talking to someone who's, who, who suffered, like I said, and can understand a coping process or a, or a strategy to get, to get better. But I think, uh, I prefer like the, the biggest thing I wanted to say by talking about it is that it's to the people that were like I was, that would say, it's it's weak. You're, you're a professional sports person, or, or you're, you're you're in you're in a high paid job. Whatever you do, yeah. but that's why you get paid to deal with the stress. But it's not something you can you can like. I was one of them people, and so it's like it's it's real. It's yeah. it's not it's not a fear of failure. It's not a you can't you can't help it. it, it it's something going on with your body that you're not, and you don't even. It's not even that you're not in control of it. You don't know you're not in control of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think so it's more for the people that were like I was that will like push on it, you know? And we know there's some there's some high profile people on social media that that have done it through the Olympics and that and and uh it, it can be quite it, it can be really it can be really damaging. And I can just I just wanna say it because it's from I felt that journey. I, I was like that. Yeah. You know? Well, it's, it's good of you to come on here and talk about it like this. It really is. And I really want to talk now then about what happened in 2021 in the context of all this stuff. And I, it was very interesting for me because obviously we worked together almost 10 years ago at the <laughs> London Olympics. And so I've loved following your career and keeping in touch since then. And I saw your tweet saying, oh, bloody hell, I'm in the Tour de France. And how... how how soon before the tour started was that when you knew you were it was not long was it five days right. and so I'm going to be honest with you my wife said I said oh look Mark's in the tour again and she went oh my god how do you reckon he'll do and I said 
I think he's just like, people just love having the name in the team. I don't, I don't think he'll do much. <laughs> Because I, like the rest of the world, had seen the journey without the understanding of what you'd been through. Like, when you got that call that you were going to be in the tour with a few days' notice, did you think, like me, well, you know, they obviously want Mark Cavendish's name, or did you go, brilliant, I'm going to equal Eddie Merckx's record and win stage after stage and be the sporting success story of the summer? No, I just thought, look, I wouldn't have gone if I didn't think I could be competitive. I didn't think I could win. I, like I said, I strived. So your belief hadn't been knocked by all of the things that we just talked about? Mm, no, but no, but belief not because I did the process of, of what I need to do. Be there perhaps in another year, like or another, you know, is you don't have the same belief, but it's perhaps because you know you're not, you haven't trained the, the same, or you've there's someone who's going really good. You know, like I'm quite realistic as. Is when I'm when I'm going into something, and uh, yeah, obviously I wasn't the the number one sprint on my team. I'd come back to to the kind of quicks at my old team, and I was quite happy not to be the the have the pressure of the whole team on my shoulders. I'm quite happy to be could get back and without that pressure like that, all I could do was fail. You uh, say I could do what I wanted to do and go and choose how like, how I was going to win bike race. You had a sense of freedom. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, well, yeah, freedom from everything getting scrutinised. Like, I could, I could be, ride my bike. Yeah. I could be a kid again riding my bike. And, uh, okay, it's, it's fortunate to be in that position. Like, But, uh, yeah, it, it was... I just I had to like I'd, I was already there was already talk a couple of weeks before that Sam Bennett the 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 number one sprinter team had got a sore knee and I was like shit I might go to the Tour de France like and so I went to Italy on a training camp for ten days I hadn't prepared for the tour I hadn't done any climbs and that and uh, even the team like they'd said don't bother going like he'll be all right. And I was like, well, it's, it's my, like, if he doesn't go, I've got to be, I'm not going to be ready for the tour, but I've got to be as ready as I, as I possibly can be. And uh, so I went out to Italy. Keep hitting this microphone. <laughs> but anyway, I went to, I went out to Italy and uh, just trying to lose some weight for it, just try and be in. I knew my, I knew my sprint was there. So I knew it, could, but it was about the Tour de France is more than just sprinting. You have to get to and that, that's what I went there to prepare. And, uh, yeah, like, I knew I'd be there, thereabouts. Um, I thought I was, for yeah, like, I, I knew physically, I knew I could win a stage, and I should. And it wouldn't be luck that I won. Um, but it would be bad, like, something can happen that you don't, you know, it's the Tour de France. Like I said, it's not one versus one. So many variables that can happen. But then when I won the first one, um, I knew I'd win multiple after that. And not just me, my my team. Like we, yeah, it's your perception of how good you're going is. Everyone's there then, aren't they? You can know how good you're going before you against your competitors. But when you're with your competitors, then you can really know how you're going compared to them. Then you you know how much you can't you can't or you should succeed. You know. So when you describe this idea of having your self belief and keeping that robust and knowing that even though there might be people doubting you, you think I can go there and do and do a really good job. Would you explain to us the process of how you develop and nurture that idea of having belief in yourself? I don't know and I didn't know till till really recently and I still don't know fully because it's always always just there. I can't really put it into words. Apart from you know, if you do a process and it, it, if you know you've not cut a corner in a process, you do. Like that's how you know you can be your best. Mm. Yeah. To talk about being the best of everyone, I don't know. Like, but give us I, an I example of what a process looks like for you. I have a training program. I have a target. Basically, like you have a target power. That'll be an, a sprint power, say, a max power output. 
and you have a target weight and the max power for it varies for different people like without going into too much i i know what works for me i know what should make me competitive for that so i work on my sprint for that also i know what i need to do to get over the climbs um and so it's a it's basically a power to weight ratio right. um so uh you have a balance of yeah you need to be able to put so much power at this weight and you go this speed but the heavier you are at the same power you go slower or the less power you are at the same weight the slower you go you know if, yeah if that makes sense and so it's and sci- it's so scientific now that you you can pretty much know you you, you know you do a lactate threshold test lactic acid threshold test and that at the beginning of the year so you can know what you can do to work on it and it's, um yeah and like, i have a coach and i never really worked with a coach when i was younger i just knew if i went out i just trained hard i knew if i trained hard i was trained harder than everyone I knew how if did I you know that longer, though i just did like it's, it's it's your head you know you, you i maybe i maybe wasn't but i there can't mean anyone who's training you know that that's maybe like what I'm saying, there can't be like that in my head. There can't yeah, be anyone that's yeah. training as much as me. But I can't. I physically cannot do anymore. I mentally cannot do anymore. I'm not cracking. I'm doing just when I think I'm finished. It's one more, one more climb, one more hour. What right. it's always like, you know, it was always like that. And how many times in all these years of training have you given up? Have you stopped and thought, now I'm not going to, com- I'm not going to complete this today. Or I'm not in the mood. Um. Do you allow yourself to go there? Because it strikes me that could be a dangerous place nah, to go. Sometimes it does, but it, it, it'd be once or twice, like, you know. In your whole career? Yeah, it's not It's not a lot. Like, uh, unless you physically, like, for instance, my training, my, my coach has set me training program now. And, it, and it, honestly, this is the first time I've really worked with a coach that I truly believe, like, even if I don't understand their process, yeah, I trust it over my own like I, w- I would always question always question it and not question saying i don't think you're right just why am i doing this why am i doing that what are we getting from this explaining a race situation you know and uh but i've got this trainer now and he was a bike rider and he's like he's eccentric and there's but there's gene there's so much genius in it like, i'm like He's, I met him this year. I used to race with him 15 years ago when he was a rider. And he's, like, if, if he told me to jump now, we're in BT Tower now. If he said, jump down there now, and I promise you, you go better, I'll go, I can't believe it. You know? see, see, that to me is fascinating because that's quite a big leap from, like when I was reading about your career, I, I read the, the uh, when Rod Ellen I've spoke about when you first went to Bitty Cycling and all the other kids turned up with parents, dropping them mm-hmm. off. And he described you getting the boat over on your own, getting the train from Liverpool to Manchester and just showing up on your own. And it was that sense of independence and early ownership of being almost self-sufficient in many ways. So to make the leap to now trust somebody yeah. is a huge one. So what is it that's led you to open up and yeah. do that? Well, I've, no, I think... Uh, like it would be a nice thing to say it was an independence that I, it, it probably wasn't a healthy thing it wasn't really independence it was just it was a kind of a nature that i did my own thing if that makes sense so like 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 like, like questioning what this probably a professional coach that says not a question what they do, like you don't agree with it, but asking it's probably not the best thing, like like in society anyway, that time of thing, it's not the best thing to do. But uh, in terms of performance, for sure, like you, it has a bigger bearing to understand why you're doing what you're doing than just, just blindly doing it. And uh, as we move on in the, as you grow up, you, you learn that people know shit you don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. people do stuff you don't do. Like, and this the magic of the growth mindset. Yeah, exactly. Right so in this coaching relationship then, what's what's one thing that you've learned 
that you hadn't been doing previously in your career? I don't know. We'll get back to that. Let me have a <laughs> you can't say nothing or you can't yeah. be listening. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> what? I, I, yeah. Just not like it's more structured, like a structure, like looking at just on a physical perspective, looking at um, recovery and and uh, and stuff. If that means like, like like re how rest is important as the actual training and stuff okay. like that, um, and like actual, you can go out and go hard, and you'll go good. But like real specific go this hard for this long because you like it's different to just going out and going hard or go or really go easy here because you can get a base in your butt you're, you're riding your bike but you're not accumulating the fatigue you'd get so you actually right we need you to that you need we need you to not accumulate fatigue so you can be recovered for this race if, if that makes sense yeah, yeah. stuff like that like just just like everyone else does I've, I've learned to be like everyone else and just trust the coach i guess you know just a scientific process more than just and is there an element of know. being kinder to yourself as well in there though mark of not like pushing yourself beyond the point of exhaustion or beating yourself up as no, no i don't think so i think uh i don't think i've changed at all in terms of like if I if I if nah, no I have since I was young when I was young didn't win I wasn't happy didn't matter why I didn't win wasn't happy as you get older like even before I I had like like my my bad years like like I learned to understand that okay if you, something out of your control you can't that's that's what can you do you can't get angry about that you can be upset about it. But ultimately, it doesn't matter what you go away and analyze. You can't change it for the next time. That was just bad luck. So what led you, know? you to to make that realization? Because just growing up, really, just growing up. I think having kids that changes you as a person, doesn't it? It makes you understand things aren't in your control. <laughs> like I, I used to have everything was in straight lines and like tight, like completely tidy. When I was a kid, I was not that tidy. And then when I moved away, when we started with the under 23 program, I realized my mom's not going to tidy my plate off. And I became, I started to tidy my stuff, but just because I knew no one was going to do it. And it perhaps went like, I got like quite, um, like really tidy, you know? And uh, actually having kids, like, you can't make them embrace the madness. Man. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's the only way. Yeah. <laughs> but it's probably quite healthy for you as well, actually. For someone who maybe, if you were just full-time in your cycling world, you'd end up with a bit of OCD or whatever, being obsessed about the small details. Kids remind you about the bigger picture. And I, I think this story of yours over the last few years has probably been really healthy in that, in that respect. You know, we had Johnny Wilkinson on the podcast saying that washing up is as important as winning the Rugby World Cup because you're using your body to achieve a goal, is what he said. And if winning the Rugby World Cup is more important and he no longer plays rugby, is he less of a guy, right? We have Hector Bayer in the Arsenal player saying he lives like a candle. So he's got a constant flame, whether things are great or things are bad. He's the one in the middle, you know. His friends don't ring him when he loses games of football. His manager doesn't talk to him, whatever. He's stable. And I think there's a real element of this in your career. You know, you were like the main man when it came to the world of sprinting and everybody loved you. Then you have an illness and you struggled and the team around you didn't know how to deal with it. And I'm sure you still have in your head a list of people that stopped calling, stopped caring, stopped <laughs> wanting to be going out for drinks with you on whatever. But then when you get successful again, you get back in the tour and you have that amazing summer. It's probably a, a lesson you've taken to be stable and be in the middle because actually, as you've learned to your cost for a period of time, if you can't keep that mental stability and let all the madness roam around you, then it, it can impact you hard. Well, it still does, though. Like, I haven't learned to, to deal with it and be stable. I just learned to cope with when I'm a bit unstable, if that makes sense. So do you still, 
you still allow yourself to get really high with the wins and really low with the bad days or not? Um, don't no, I don't really like. I, I think, yeah, to say allow myself to no, but I feel it happening. If that makes sense, and d- does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, that's the negative side, right? It just it comes to you. What about the, on the positive stuff? Like, how long, for example, did you s- sit at home and pat yourself on the back for the tour you had? No, uh, not not at all. Not at all. Really, yeah. Like really, like it's nice to. I, I haven't. Have you ever done it in your whole career? Nah, not really. You know, like I always set another target. I think uh, it was never like. Of course, I was happy with what I'd done, but I never ever kind of looked back over my shoulder and gone, "Oh, that was good." Like I always had to set something else to yeah. to do, and there's been so many athletes that they've done one thing and they live off that, yeah. and they can never then move forward again. And I think it was, yeah, like the only the only thing that I probably would if I'd have probably won on the Champs Elysees. I'd have perhaps stopped my career and looked back on my old career at two days after the Tour de France. You think so? Do you know? I, I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't. Maybe I wouldn't. But I think about it now. Mm. But, See, uh, do you know why I think this is really interesting? Is Because the one thing that defines you to me is relentlessness, right? Yeah. We've all seen them, haven't we? People who are like the next big thing and six months later you can't remember their name. But you've been there year after year, event after event, win after win. But if you don't stop and enjoy it, What's the point? I don't know any different, mate. I don't know any. It's just what I do. It's who I am. It's what I did. I've got kids now that, like, that changes a lot. When you see how proud they are of you, it's nice, isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah. like, it, it, you have a, probably the same hunger for the win, but for a different purpose. Like, well, you know, I didn't even know. I never knew the purpose. And probably I say now, I want to make my kids proud. It's the only purpose I can think of. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know? I, I just don't know any different. It's all. Are I've you done. proud though of yourself? Um. I don't know really. I don't, don't know. Has there ever been a moment where you where? When you think back over the highlight trail of, of of your life, even that you go back to in your head and go, that was a moment where I'd be happy to stand by. Actually, I'll go back. Yeah, that f- first winner this year's Tour de France in Fougere. Like everything I should have stopped riding my bike years ago I should have everything was like my body was damaged my mental health was damaged my legacy was getting damaged every year I carried on and didn't do it I was that guy that should have stopped and I knew I'd come back I, I knew there was something wrong with me I knew that if I knew I'd be back oh, I would have stopped I wasn't hanging on to anything and doing it and I was proud then Jake and I won I like being back there like, like that yeah. was like, just fuck all years like you know anyone who <laughs> just give up even like the closest people I know for 20 years give up you know and I, I said no I, I know I know what I need to do and and to do it and that was like yeah, to be able to, I know everyone will say they've had hard times and a lot, m- m- many, many people like have had a lot harder times than I have. So I'm not here, but really, <laughs> if if I could get back to where I am from where I was, anybody can get back. If if you feel low, if you feel like that it's unattainable to get back, just don't give up. You, don't give up like because and people give up around you do not give up if you believe you do it like like really you do it so those people that did doubt you then 
I'm interested in how you've how you've dealt with the doubters since that moment where you have felt vindicated internally. It's like it's not that like doubters like like fans or media don't matter like that's uh, no, but you're in a circle. These people yeah. have known you for twenty years. Is what I'm interested in. It's yeah, like you know, like it's not not it's not even doubt. Like, yeah, it's just like just when you know if 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 it's a weird thing because if you doubt yourself and someone doubts you, then you've got that confirmation. So it's it, it doesn't make any difference, do you know. Um, it might be like, oh, but you've given yourself that excuse. If you know what's going on with you, it's your yeah. body. Like, yeah. do you know? You know what's going on with you and you know... A lot of people take stuff as an excuse, if that makes sense. Yeah. And you're... You, you know that if something's not right or something's going to hinder you, you know before you go into it mm. what's going to happen. And you know you're not going to be able to succeed because that's going to happen. And then, and but you're saying it before and then it happens. And then like, you make an excuse. Well, I told you before that it was yeah. going to happen. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And you say, I just need this in place, this in place, this in place. And they go, well, nah. And, and, and you know that, you know the excuse before you go in, but you know it's not, if yeah, that yeah. makes sense. You it's know the it. the process it, stuff again. Yeah, it. it's literally, like, it's hard, it's hard I can't, like. Uh, Knowing yourself is so important, isn't it? Yeah. And, and having the courage to, believe that what you believe is yeah. is the way to go so yeah so it seems that you're ruthlessly honest with yourself so how do you handle bullshitters people that the oh god that's no time for <laughs> like yeah. but it come, that's why it can come across like like but even down to like it, it can be it can come across as frosty can't it because it's got no time for it for bullshit or, or someone who's not committed to their job. Do you know, like, anybody who works with me, like, I'll give them 100%. I expect they give 100%, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. um, even journalists, like, like, I get frustrated and, like, I can't hide it. You know, with, like, a... An uneducated question, like somebody, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can tell a good journalist from like someone who's just they're just getting a quote or something, or not even just getting a quote. It's, it's it they haven't put work into their job. They're not put any, and it's it's not just there uh, insulting to me. It's insulting to them and their colleagues. Like do you know what I mean? They're just plan through do, doing that and, and I can't hide that frustration that someone not like giving 100% to what they, they have like, you know? I've really enjoyed this conversation because I came into this really desperately hoping that we would try and get some kind of insight into how someone isn't successful once but they're successful time and time and time again and I yeah. think whether it is not suffering fools setting your own standards being totally honest with yourself finding the process and then knowing yourself so well that you stick to that process when others are there to knock you off it. Um, it's been so interesting. So interesting. We always finish with some quick fire questions if you don't okay. mind. Um, and the first one is a popular one. People will take this on board and they'll live with it. So you better, you better give us a good one here. Three non negotiable behaviors that you similar to what we were just talking about, that you and the people around you must buy into? What are the three things they have to bring to the table to be part of Mark Cavendish's circle? A commitment. Uh, passion for what you do. And team, teamwork that has to work, have to be at work in a team. 
If you could go back to one moment in your life, what would it be and why? That's, I don't know if that's quick fire. Like, yeah. <laughs> There's this, there's a fair few that I don't know. I can't pinpoint one. There's some real beautiful times, and um, my kids being born, like, and there's also some times that you know when you finish a race. Charms are easy this year. Straight after, I'm like, fuck, let's rewind it. <laughs> Just do it a different way. There, 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 there's so many for good and bad. I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't know. How important is legacy to you? Yeah, pretty important. I'd quite like it. I'd, what would you like it to be? I don't know. It's not. I don't want to write the legacy. I don't. I don't want to say what it is. Um, I don't think one one can can say what it should be. That, it, but you know, like ancient Greeks, the biggest honor was to have a legend named after you, and it was was to be told in in mm. Greek mythology. And uh, I always had you know for the book a good cyclist. Like, like you talk about Eddie Merckx and or if, if you talked about Eddie Merckx or Bernardino or, or Freddie Martins, I wanted to be in that list. That was it. But I don't know how. That, that, that. A book, a podcast or a TV series that our, that our listeners should absorb? I don't know, really. So, yeah, I don't knew know. that was going to be your answer. Because so, so much of your inspiration comes from within, right? Rather yeah. than our... I'll read that book and I'll <laughs> be inspired to do something amazing. That's such a clever way of, of thinking of it, yeah. But you wrote your yeah, own book is. at 24. Do you want to throw that one in? <laughs> no. The next book. There's, a next, there's, a, there's, a, there's another book. Called, there's one coming out at the end of the, week, at the, end of the year. For there you go. That'll be the one. Um, and the That'll final be. final question. <laughs> what is, and this is something to leave our audience thinking about, really, and we've spoken about so many different things, but what is your one golden rule for people to live a high performance life honestly there's this two go on then you have to you have to enjoy what you're doing you don't always love it or it can be hard work but you have to love it it's a, it's a passion you have yeah you, you have to do that and do do not like give up don't give up a session don't give up a goal like you see them through to the end whether they're successful or not there you go and that's how you win not once but win relentlessly uh what an interesting conversation thank you so much for coming on here and i think it's especially powerful the conversation we have about you know vulnerability and sacrifice and struggle because you're still a competing athlete it's always very different i think when someone's retired and they go yeah. oh now i can really tell my story the fact that you're willing to have these conversations and then go out on the road and compete against other people with them knowing these things about you i think is uh is testament to you as a person so thank you i appreciate thank it you. thanks for having me guys oh, sorry you. i waffle on sometimes you know hey you think about yeah, it which you, is yeah. um a mark of how you've lived your life i think so thank you incredible no, thank, thank you, you guys. really enjoyed it please hit subscribe hit the notification bell give us a thumbs up leave a review but somehow get involved with the high performance podcast and become part of our growing community thanks for being part of the adventure